finally finally let us uh, let us consider a case where which we have not considered before where a rectangular plate is modeled with four noded plate elements the four noded plate elements have uh, are rectangles with four nodes and uh, there's a thickness uh, t uh, and these plate elements are subjected these plate elements are like beam elements but in two dimensions so uh, each uh, if you take a small element of area let's say on the y uh, yz plane then this small element of area uh, can suffer the following deformations uh, one this cross section entire cross section of um, thickness t and uh, and dy width uh, can suffer a translation in the uh, z direction either upwards or downwards just like a beam does and the vertical displacement is given by w so if any point in uh, on the cross section can uh, move up or down along the z axis by an amount w which is the same as the amount by which the uh, principal axis uh, or or the centroidal axis of the cross section moves up or down so the centroidal axis moves by, up by w then the point p also will move up by w so the z displacement the z displacement of the plate uh, will be a function uh, of x and y so this w may be different in different parts of the of the element and then the z displacement is a function of x and y uh, the y and the x displacements are uh, explained here so this cross section can suffer a rotation due to due to a rotation applied at the nodes it can suffer a rotation of theta x and when it suffers a rotation of theta x a point p here would uh, move by a distance um, which is uh, z times theta x so uh, this length is very small this length is dy so this distance the distance connecting uh, the point to the origin is almost equal to z and this is therefore this distance is therefore z theta x z theta x has a component of z theta x cos theta x along the y-axis so and on the negative y-axis in the negative direction cos theta x for theta x small cos theta x is almost equal to 1 so the v displacement of a point p is given by minus z times theta x similarly uh, due to uh, theta y applied here due to theta y applied here uh, this cross section can tilt in uh, either the forward direction or the backward direction here we have sh I've shown a forward direction so a point P located here would move by this amount which is again equal to Z times theta Y which has a component of course Z times theta Y cos theta Y but we can again take cos theta Y equal to 1 for small theta Y and therefore U is given by Z times theta Y so uh, for a cross section that does not for a small elemental cross section that does not suffer any uh, that that does not suffer any change of shape it only translates or rotates uh, because of the deformation of this plate uh, these are the three displacement components that appear uh, two of these appear for the beam as well but uh, here you have three and now you can get the strain components for example epsilon xx would be got by del u del x epsilon uh, yy by del v del y and so on so if you write down the stresses uh, write down the strains now by taking derivatives of the displacements these would be the strains these are the strains that you get and uh, these strains can now be used in the constitutive equation in order to get the stresses. 
Uh, now note here that uh, the strains epsilon xx, epsilon yy and epsilon xy uh, vary linearly with the z coordinate. So because of this, the stresses are also expected to vary linearly with z and uh, in elasticity theories of structural elements like beams and plates, it is customary to work with stress resultants, which are the combined effect of the integ integration of stresses across the small thickness of the plate or the beam. So, for example, uh, if I want to calculate the moment generated by the sigma xx stress uh, per unit length of the plate then what i'll do is i can take a small element a small element of area like this pardon my poor drawing so this has a area of dy times dz and the traction on this on this area is sigma xx and the moment caused by this sigma xx is uh, the total force is therefore uh, this and the moment caused by it about the neutral axis is z integrated from minus t by 2 to plus t by 2. If you want the moment per unit area, you, unit, unit length in the y direction, then you take this to be 1 and therefore this is the moment mxx uh, acting on this plane. Similarly, for yy, we can take moments about the neutral axis or the neutral plane, we can take an element of this type where this is equal to dz times dx and then if you want moments about for uh, uh, moments per unit length then you have to divide by dx and myy is the moment per unit length given by this stress resultant. Uh, similarly for mxy and uh, these uh, these uh, stresses don't create moments because the moments created by the top half cancelled out by the moments created by the bottom half. On the other hand, these stresses, when the stresses vary in this fashion, uh, where it's tensile on one half and compressive on the other half, uh, do not generate any resultant forces. These generate resultant forces but don't generate any resultant moment. And uh, the resultant force generated by sigma zx is qx, which is the integration of sigma zx dz from minus t by 2 to t by 2, and qy, which is the integration of sigma yz. These components are shown in the figure on the right. Now, these again are forces per unit length. These are forces per unit length, whereas these are moments per unit length. Now, in uh, Kirchhoff plate theory, similar to in the uh, Euler Bernoulli beam theory, uh, this strain epsilon yz and epsilon xz are taken to be almost equal to zero, which implies that w comma x is equal to minus theta y and w comma y is equal to theta x. So uh, these are the assumptions in the, uh, these, these, these are the outcomes of the assumptions in the Kirchhoff plate theory that lead to the approximation of theta x, the rotation about the x axis and the rotation about the y axis in terms of del w del y and del w del x. Remember, in the Euler Bernoulli beam theory, there is only one theta which is uh, given by del w del x. So here there are two thetas like we showed in, in, in the beginning of this lecture and these two thetas are given by the partial derivatives of uh, the vertical displacement function w x y. Uh, with, this, with this assumption, um, epsilon xx, epsilon yy and epsilon xy are the only components of strain that are present on the plate and 
if you apply the constitutive equation, assuming that sigma zz is in general 0. Uh, remember sigma zz on the top face, on the top face should equal qxy, whereas sigma zz on the bottom face should equal 0, which means that over the small thickness of this plate, sigma zz should start from qx and qxy and quickly become 0. Um, to, to make things simpler, it is assumed that it is 0 everywhere. We neglect it uh, everywhere. Uh, otherwise, we should, we should think of a function that goes like this. Because t is a very small number, so it should be q at the top and this is how sigma zz should vary. But um, since we are dealing with very small t's, we neglect the sigma zz completely and then it becomes a plain stress state where sigma xx, sigma yy and sigma xy are the only stress components that are non-zero in case of a plate element. And uh, then we can write the constitutive equation uh, in this manner where the stresses are related to the three strains using the plain stress constitutive equation, plain stress stiffness equation that we had derived some time ago. So this is for plain stress. For plain strain, this factor is different. Uh, I already mentioned that this is, this is the outcome of the Kirchhoff plate theory and once you have this, once you have this, then you can write down epsilon xx. Epsilon xx can be written down as z times, so uh, you see that this is theta y comma x. So uh, theta y comma x is uh, w xx. This is, uh, this is theta x comma y, x comma y is uh, w y y and this is z times uh, w theta y comma y which is w x y uh, so minus w x y minus w x y again so that is equal to 2 minus 2 w x y so uh, you can show this pretty easily that this is the, these are going to be the strains these are going to be the strains in uh, in terms of the uh, vertical displacement function w x y so the second derivatives are involved these are generally called curvatures these are generally called curvatures and uh, these constitute a curvature vector which is This is the curvature vector which takes the role of the strain and uh, further we can express this constitutive equation in which is in terms of stress in terms of the stress resultants. Remember the stress resultants that are relevant in this case are uh, mxx, myy and mxy. These are the three stress resultants that are, that are relevant in this case. So armed with this plane stress constitutive equation, uh, we can now write the strain energy stored in the material. So the strain energy stored would be from minus T by 2 to T by 2 and integrated over the area of the plate, uh, half sigma ij epsilon ij dv, right? So half sigma ij epsilon ij includes sigma xx epsilon xx, uh, sigma yy epsilon yy, sigma xy epsilon xy and sigma yx epsilon yx which is these two are, are the same as we already know so write it like this which can further be written as sigma xx sigma yy sigma xy multiplied with epsilon xx, epsilon yy and 2 epsilon xy. 
where finally epsilon xx is in terms of w this, epsilon yy is this, and epsilon 2 epsilon xy is this. So this is what we do. Then we multiply, then we then we integrate over dz and dA. So uh, this will give me the total strain energy stored in the material. So this is the total strain energy stored in the material and <coughs> this minus t by 2 to t by 2 there should be a minus here. So this minus t by 2 to t by 2 can be taken inside and here this can be replaced by minus z times w x x this can be replaced by minus z times w y y and this can be replaced by minus 2 z w x y this z can go here and then this integral can be got in here it can be done for the first term second term and third term and then you see that these are exactly the definitions of the stress resultants that we had, uh, that we had defined earlier. So mxx, myy, and mxy are the stress resultants. So this is uh, this is a multiplication dot product between the stress resultant uh, vector formed by these three guys and the curvature vector formed by these three. So uh, this is the strain energy stored in the material. Work done by the external loads is of course Q times W dS integrated over the area and uh, therefore therefore we can uh, now uh, use the constitutive equation once again and what we can do is we can uh, we can we can try to reframe the constitutive equation in terms of mxx, MX, myy and mxy. So to do that, uh, I leave it as an exercise to you. Uh, so you have to do the integration on the left from minus t by 2 to t by 2. Remember this is equal to mxx. This is mxx. And you have to do the same integration on the right. Uh, multiply with z and then dz. If you do that, if you do that, then you should remember that you have minus z w x x here. So uh, there's one z here, one z here that you have multiplied on the left. One z was already there, so you have z square for each of these terms, and therefore. Uh, when you do the integration, it is quite straightforward to show that uh, what you get is this, this constant in front. And this whole thing is the stiffness matrix, stiffness for, not the stiffness matrix, it's the stiffness for the plate. And this relates, this stiffness now relates the stress resultants, which are the moments mxx, myy, mxy, to the curvature. So this is a moment curvature relationship and this is mediated by what is known as the flexural rigidity. This plays the role of EI in your beam theory. This is a flexural rigidity that relates the moments with the uh, curvature. So uh, as I said, this, this will be denoted by the curvature vector kappa. Now, uh, we have almost everything that we need to put into the finite element model. So, <coughs> finally, your energy becomes half K transpose. So, uh, go back to the energy. So, this is, uh, this is your moment. And we have already shown that the moment is C plate into W. So this is this is kappa transpose C plate into kappa and there's a half in the front. 
So this guy is already written as C plate times kappa. So this is C plate times this is kappa. So C plate times kappa. Transpose of this is kappa transpose C plate transpose, but 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 C plate is uh, C plate is symmetric, so C plate transpose is same as C plate, and therefore uh, this is this is half kappa transpose C plate transpose kappa. Now that's our starting point. So this is equal to minus half integration over the area of the plate kappa transpose C plate kappa D S. So this is our starting point and this is the potential of the loads. Now when I uh, when I use the assumed displacement method uh, my strategy will remain the same. So I will first approximate the field variable which is the vertical displacement W function of X and Y in terms of a shape function and the nodal displacements the nodal displacements in this case will turn out to be first the vertical displacement itself then uh, the rotation in the x direction the rotation in the y direction for all the nodes For all the nodes, there are four nodes, so there are 12 degrees of freedom. So I will express uh, the field variable at any point inside the element with the interpolation function from the nodal displacements. The strain, which in this case is the curvature vector kappa, will be expressed as B times U, where B is the strain displacement matrix, and then uh, I will write the local stiffness matrix as B transpose C plate times B and uh, the assumption here is I am relating the curvatures to the moments. I have a moment curvature relationship which is given by this. I am not using a stress strain relationship but I am using a moment curvature relationship in this, in this case. So uh, the first task is to find a proper shape function and we will do this with the uh, with the assumed displacement method as I said. The element that I am considering I will just want to remind you is an element of uniform thickness t. It's an element of uniform thickness t and has four nodes uh, and um, with these four nodes I have 12 degrees of freedom. So in the assumed displacement method, I can, uh, I can uh, approximate W with a polynomial containing 12 terms uh, where there are 12 undetermined constants. Since I have 12 degrees of freedom, I can determine 12 undetermined constants. You will see that uh, this has uh, all the terms all the terms possible up to the third order uh, and for the fourth order it does not have all the terms but it has uh, it has two of them it is two fourth order terms so it's a polynomial uh, of degree four but it's an incomplete polynomial because it does not contain all the possible fourth order terms now once you have assumed w then uh, we will go ahead and assume the uh, three degrees of freedom. So these three things are functions of x and y. These are at any point inside the element and they are given by w is given by w which I have approximated. Theta x is given by del w del y and this is given by minus del w del x. And I have this approximation for w so I can easily calculate del w del x and del w del y plug it in here, plug it in place of this and in place of this and then have this long vector of the 12 constants, long vector of this 12 constants uh, and pre-multiplied by this 
matrix which I am going to call P and the vector containing the uh, containing the undetermined coefficients I am going to call A. So if I do P times A at any point put any value of x, y that lies inside the element I get the values of the vertical displacement rotation in the x direction and rotation in the y direction at that point at that point so now in this if i plug in the uh, values at the nodes values of x and y at the nodes then i should be say if i plug in the values of x and y at node 1 then i should get the w at node 1 theta at node 1 theta x at node 1 and theta y at node 1. So that's what I'm going to do because I know the nodal coordinates. I'm going to use that to determine this A uh, vector. So this is, uh, this is what I will get when I plug in the values of x and y at node 1. This is what I will get when I plug in values at node 2. So these are the values of x and y at node 1 followed this will be followed by values of x and y of node 2 there will be 12 uh, rows in this and you will immediately recognize that this is what I had defined as my nodal displacement uh, nodal displacement vector nodal displacement vector and I call this vector as a and then I have a multiplication with uh, with this long vector on the right so to determine this long vector, I can take the inverse of A and uh, small u, which is small u, uh, which is actually W, W, X, Y. So the small u is actually W theta x theta y so this vector is called small this vector i'm calling small u and small u will be given by uh, p a inverse capital u where a inverse capital u is obviously small a so remember uh, that this was small u was p times a i'm replacing a by uh, a inverse u so this is the relation that connects the nodal displacements to the displacements at any point inside the element displacements meaning generalized displacements containing the vertical displacement theta x and theta y at any point so this must be your shape function and that is what we will call n so here again we have found the shape function from uh, uh, from the assumed displacement method and we have not used the definition of shape function to find it. We have just found it from the uh, assumed displacement method. So it, uh, we might not have explicit forms of the shape function because this is too complicated a function to invert like we did in case of the beam. So we will not be able to find the values of the shape, uh, the, the functional forms of the shape functions in 1, n2, n3. But nevertheless, this is my shape function matrix that I have found from the assumed displacement technique. Now, once I have found this, it is easy to find the curvature tensor. So the curvature, uh, sorry, the curvature vector. So the curvature vector is second derivative of W, second derivative of W with respect to Y and uh, the mixed derivative of W. Uh, and again, since you know the form of W from here, since you know the form of W from here, the second derivatives are easy to calculate. And when you calculate them, this is what you should get. This is what you should get. And this can in turn be written in this form. So you can write kappa again uh, in the form of uh, A1, this long vector A1, A2, A3, A4, and so on. Uh, where in the first row, for example, this would be 0, 2, 3 would be 0, then you will have minus 2, then 5, 6 will be 0, then you have minus 6, and then you will have a 0, then you have minus 2, and so on, uh, 2, sorry, uh, 
6 minus 6 x and minus 2 y and so on you will have a matrix which we are now going to call uh, q times a and then again replace a by a inverse u which we have already found so this guy here is your strain displacement matrix which connects your generalized displacements at the nodes to your generalized strains which are actually the curvatures which are actually the curvatures in, in this case so b can be found as q a inverse again the explicit form of b may not be possible uh, but we can find it numerically uh, we can find it by multi we can form q we can form a and we can invert a and multiply them to find b once you have done this the entire procedure is exactly the same as we have done for the bar and the beam and the stiffness of the plate element is then given by q transpose c plate b so i hope you understand this derivation carefully for the plate beam as well as the bar because this is a very standard thing that we are going to do over and over again in this course uh, ae is the area of the element and you have to do the integration over that in order to get the local stiffness just like we did in the case of the beam and the bar now uh, what kind of an element is this what kind of a shape function is this uh, this constitutes a shape function which are uh, typically known as non-conforming shape functions these are known as non-conforming shape functions because uh, of this reason consider an element number consider element number one and element number two which have a common edge that coincides with the x-axis so y is equal to zero on this if y is equal to zero on this then w and uh, theta x and theta y so this is theta uh, i think this is theta uh, theta y minus theta y so this is minus theta y and this is theta x so these are easily calculated uh, putting this is calculated by putting y equal to 0 in uh, in the basic assumption for w that we have made then uh, you take the first derivative put y equal to 0 you get this first derivative with respect to y put y equal to 0 you get this now in this there are eight constants one two three four these three are repeated five six seven and eight but to determine these eight constants you have three degrees of freedom here and three degrees of freedom here so six degrees of freedom cannot be used to um, to uh, find the eight constants from these three equations now uh, because i know i will know w at capital i w x at capital i w y at capital i i will know at capital j this at capital j and this at capital j but that won't be enough that won't give me enough equations to determine all the eight constants which means that when i when i calculate these things from the top element and when i can calculate these from the bottom element they won't match on the ij line they won't match on the ij line uh, which means that the vertical displacements that i get just above this may be different from the vertical displacements that i get just below it uh, which makes this L, this uh, shape function and this assumption this kind of element non-conforming however uh, they are still quite popular they are quite widely used in plate bending problems so um, this is just a curiosity that you need to keep in mind while using these elements that they are non-conforming in nature we will talk uh, a lot more about about the quality of elements in a later lecture but for this week this is where we end all assumed displacement method problems uh, end here and uh, 
will not do any more of them. And then and now we will go on to see, uh, look at more formal methods, more automated methods of determining the shape functions.